Hi, my name is Connor Brown, and I'm the Director of Sales Engineering here at Spire Federal. I'm pleased to be here at the 2021 CubeSat Developers Workshop, albeit virtually, to discuss reducing data latency using inter-satellite links. The agenda for today is as follows. First, I'll provide a quick overview of the Spire constellation, as well as highlight the ground station network. Next, I'll talk about inter-satellite links and why these are so critical to reduce our global data latency. Next, I'll touch on a couple of radio frequency ISL missions that Spire has ongoing, as well as highlight some trials from recent on-orbit demonstrations. And lastly, I'll go over the next steps. So first, a short overview on the Spire constellation. With our last launch in January of this year, we operate over 110 satellites in distributed low Earth orbits. These low Earth multi-use receivers, or lemur CubeSats, contain a suite of RF remote sensing payloads to collect a variety of data for our customers. We use these satellites to track maritime, aviation, weather, and other activities from space. So whether it's collecting over 30 million AIS messages from maritime vessels, or performing over 10,000 daily radio occultations of the Earth's atmosphere to improve weather forecasting capabilities, it's safe to say our data provides a truly global view with coverage in remote, in remote regions like the poles or an open ocean. In addition to these data products and analytics services we provide our customers, we also offer space services, enabling our customers to deploy their own software applications or hardware into space on our platforms or to partner with Spire for dedicated solutions in space to meet their unique mission needs. In addition to the 110 plus satellites in low Earth orbit, we also operate a distributed ground station network of over 30 dedicated ground stations and 70 plus antenna systems. As you can see on the map pictured on this slide, we do our best to globally distribute these ground stations to maximize downlink opportunities. We also use these ground stations to send software configuration updates and to command and control the constellation. But no matter where a satellite collects a remote observation, it's safe to say that it won't be long until it comes within contact of our ground network to downlink that data to deliver that to the customer. Next, I'll talk about inter-satellite links and explain why ISLs are central to meet global data latency requirements. Data latency is perhaps the most single critical metric when assessing the utility of space-based data. Fire continues to increase data collection capabilities on orbit, with more and more satellites collecting more data for more customers. With this, Fire must continue to maintain superior data latency and continue to drive down that data latency at a global scale provide increasingly valuable products to our customer base. Whether it's users in the maritime, aviation, weather, or space services sector, our customers rely on having time-sensitive critical data delivered in a timely fashion to make data-driven decisions. Even with 30 plus ground stations and autonomous constellation management tools, the reality is so much of Spire's data is collected over open ocean or in remote regions outside the coverage of the ground segment. So in addition to strategically expanding the ground station network with more stations and dedicated areas of interest, we've come to the conclusion that the utilization of inter-satellite links is per perhaps the most impactful way to globally reduce data latency of the most time-sensitive and time-critical data for our customers. I'll talk a little bit about how we came to this conclusion now. So first, we looked at a number of simulations about targeted ground station deployment. But first, we defined several areas of interest where we wanted to increase our data collection while simultaneously decreasing our data latency. You can see these in these blue polygons on the map here on these heat maps. The leftmost chart shows our current ground stations, showing where we do best with respect to data latency collection and where we have areas or room for improvement, which is in remote regions over open oceans, not near existing ground stations. As you can see, with the addition of an arbitrary 13 ground stations, the simulation shows up to 75% relative improvement for latency in those targeted areas of interest. However, at the global scale, you can see only a 32% improvement with these 13 additional ground stations. We did a similar analysis looking at the addition of low data rate RF ISLs to our constellation. So here on the leftmost plot, we have our current constellation, uh, assuming no inter-satellite link capabilities. And on the rightmost plot, you can see the assumption of if we had RFISLs in our constellation, 
low data rate up to 5,000 spacecraft to spacecraft kilometer range. We can do an extremely effective job at filling in those gaps. And you can see very nicely filled in, even in the most remote regions on Earth, with up to 96% relative improvement based on existing capabilities. However, you'll notice we don't do as well on the designated areas of interest. And that we can conclude that the approach to dramatically reduce our data latency is a combined strategy to target ground stations relative to areas of interest, as well as deploy RF inter-satellite links throughout the constellation. Now I'll spend a little bit of time talking about RFISL, providing an overview of the SPIRE RFISL mission, as well as an update to the ongoing on-orbit demonstrations. Before doing so, I'd like to acknowledge that the SPIRE development of ISL capability is supported by funding from the UK Space Agency through the ESA ARTES Pioneer Program. So first, a short overview of the two missions. We have a Batch 1 mission, which is a set of two 3U RF ISL satellites, which launched in September 2020 on a Soyuz mission to sun-synchronous orbit. These were our first RF ISL satellites with the ambitious goal of demonstrating in-plane RF inter-satellite links. I'll go over more details on both of these missions in subsequent slides, but the next set is a batch two mission, which is a second set of two S-band RFISL 3U CubeSats, which launched across two launch vehicles uh, in the past six months. The first was NG-14 in October of 2020, uh, which launched to an ISS orbit, and the second batch two satellite launched on a SpaceX rideshare flight in January of this year. This mission had a, a more ambitious set of goals when it comes to test parameters. So this in, involved cross-plane inter-satellite communications under more stringent test conditions, as well as performing more link budget validation. A bit more on these missions specifically. The RF ISL Batch 1 mission was obviously our first flight with this capability. So it consisted primarily of the design and development of the ISL transceiver and antenna system, what we call Skyros. Before doing so, at first we had to select our frequency, which based on a variety of technical and regulatory considerations, we, we ended up selecting S-band with 1 megahertz bandwidth allocations for space-to-space -space transmission. A lot of this mission was centered about validating link budget calculations and assumptions, uh, relying heavily on the heritage of our 3U CubeSat platform and focusing all of the non-recurring engineering and risk within the demonstration itself. With this in mind, the satellite was a standard lemur constellation spacecraft. And what we did was remove the radio occultation antennas and replace those with the ISL antennas, as well as install a standalone ISL transceiver module. For this mission, we elected to launch into this both satellites into the same orbit so that they could perform low relative velocity in-plane inter-satellite link demonstrations. The RF-ISL Batch 2 mission included several updates from Batch 1. First, we focused lessons learned from the qualification and test campaign of Batch 1 to make several design improvements to the Skyros S-band RF-ISL transceiver module. These included things such as increasing the power output to the antenna by replacing the power amplifier, as well as improving the thermal performance and circuit matching to mitigate high frequency gain drops and associated noise figure variations across frequency bands. But with respect to the satellite itself, we utilized the identical Lemur 2 Heritage CubeSat bus. We also made some improvements to the antenna design, such as improving the impedance matching across substrates and optimizing the patch dimension. Lastly, we decided to take a different approach to launch of these spacecraft. Whereas for batch one, where we launched to an identical in-plane orbit, this one, we split these satellites across two distinct launch vehicles, launching one into a 51.6 degree inclination ISS orbit, and the other into a high inclination polar sun synchronous orbit. This provided us the opportunity for much higher relative velocity crossing, crossing uh, cross-link opportunities. So whereas we might see up to words of one kilometer per second uh, relative delta V between spacecrafts if they were in the same orbit, this would provide us the opportunity to see up to 15 kilometers per second relative velocity between spacecraft, really to allow us to stress test the ISL capability. So to summarize some of the trials we've done on orbit, since the launch of the first batch in September 2020, we've completed several link budget validation tests, as well as data transfer on orbit trials. 
So after completing the first stage of hardware and link characterization, the focus has shifted in 2021 to working with the batch two satellites to demonstrate practicality of ISL to truly reduce data latency. Since then, we've managed to successfully demonstrate both in-plane and cross-plane links between both batches of satellites. And with respect to distance and latency, we've been able to demonstrate a reduction in latency of over five hours achieving a maximum link distance of over 4,300 kilometers at 100 kilobaud rate. Next, I'll talk a little bit more about those specific trials. So the first was a long distance data transfer trial completed on March 18th, 2021. These were with the batch two satellites, which are in the different orbits, one being an ISS and one being in a sun synchronous orbit. These satellites are at varying altitudes. And as you can see in the figure in the left, as they cross during this cross-link opportunity, they came within 200 kilometers of one another, and the distance achieved with data transfer was just over 4,300 kilometers. Over that period of time, we were able to transfer 2.8 megabytes worth, megabytes worth of real data over the low data rate RFI cell link. Next, I'll provide a bit more information on a latency reduction trial recently completed on orbit. This test was completed between the batch two satellites on March 25th. The objective of this test was to demonstrate real data transfer of payload test data, and then to queue that data for downlink to determine the differential latency. As you can see in this test, we're able to transmit just over nine megabytes of data at a maximum range of 3,800 kilometers. Once the test was completed, we tasked both satellites to downlink that data using our standard downlink procedures. While this test was not necessarily selected to maximize this metric, it just so happened that the ground station and downlink opportunities were far more favorable to the satellite that received the data file. And in fact, we're able to real, realize a latency reduction of over five hours for this particular data file. While we've seen variations in latency reductions, this is extremely compelling evidence that RF ISL is an extremely useful technology in reducing data latency on orbit. Lastly today, I'd like to talk about the next steps for SPIRE with inter-satellite link. Moving forward, we will continue to perform on-orbit testing with the batch one and batch two RFISL satellites. It's important to remember that all four of these spacecraft are still in early operation, and there's no shortage of testing remaining. Ultimately, what we look to achieve is to continue to perform comprehensive testing at various extremes to characterize and evaluate the link, as well as have a statistically significant number of tests for our engineers to analyze and use as critical data to shape future technology development. We also look to provide some interesting on-orbit demonstrations and test case, such as the multi-hop test, where we look to take data from one satellite, relay it to another, and then onto a third before taking advantage of an opportunistic ground station path. We'll also play around with different symbol rates and modulation and coding schemes to see if we can optimize the link further on orbit with existing hardware. In parallel with the RF ISL on orbit demonstrations, the Spire engineers have been hard at work on optical inter satellite links. Free space optical or laser communications offer far greater data rates than the S band RF ISL developed to date. Higher data rates, of course, means more data can be transferred smartly on orbit enable opportunistic downlink opportunities and to reduce the data latency for a larger percentage of SPIRE data collected on orbit. Our plans have an initial tech demonstration of optical inter-satellite links this year with a full mission demonstration plan for 2022. Stay tuned. Thank you everyone for the time today. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at connor.brown at I look forward to the Q&A.